reports today that tended to make a conspiracy out of the death of John F. Kennedy in Dallas. Mariah McLaughlin reports. Most of the testimony of Dutch journalist Willem Oltmans was reports of conversations he had with mystery man George de Morenshield. De Morenshield committed suicide earlier this week, and Oltmans says that de Morenshield once told him that he was in on the plot to assassinate President Kennedy. Mr. de Morenshield told me in Dallas on the 23rd of February this year, this year that Oswald acted at his instructions and that he knew that uh, Oswald was going to kill President Kennedy sooner or later. Subcommittee Chairman Richardson Pryor did not put a committee stamp of acceptance on Oltman's testimony. The sort of thing he is saying, uh, and he's named a few people, and has not been corroborated. These are the statements of a man who is now dead, and uh, we certainly don't want to release anything like that from the committee. Oltman says he has also given the committee a picture of an anti-Castro Cuban who is alleged to have been part of the Kennedy assassination plot. Mariah McLaughlin, CBS News, Washington. More news when the World Tonight continues. The word in Washington is that President Carter is considering a big tax on gas-guzzling automobiles and it has the industry in a turmoil. First to speak out, Thomas Murphy, chairman of General Motors, and Jerry Landay covered his speech. With his New York appearance, Murphy seemed to be opening a major debate between the auto industry and the administration over energy policy and the economy. Murphy labeled the rumored conservation scheme a trial balloon and then devoted most of a 25-minute speech to shooting it down. Today, as one member of the public, I'm going to give my reaction to what I regard as one of the most simplistic, irresponsible, and short-sighted ideas ever conceived. This is the notion that one way to alleviate our energy shortage is for our government from now on to penalize by an excise tax those who purchase large cars and to encourage by a rebate those who purchase small cars. If this should ever come to pass, it would be only the latest in a long series of government interventions into the free market. In his bill of particulars, Murphy said it's unfair to place the burden of gas conservation on new cars. That, he said, would encourage potential new car buyers to hold on to their old cars even longer. Cars that burn more gas than the more efficient later models. Murphy charged that the envisioned carrot and stick approach to conservation could also stimulate the trend to foreign cars, with a loss of thousands of jobs in domestic car production. Jerry Landay, CBS News, New York. Wall Street in a moment. Stocks higher on Wall Street today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed around 927, up 8.23. The average price per share, up 25 cents on the New York Exchange. Average price, up 7 cents on the American. Wall Street on this world tonight. The federal government said today that about 500,000 more Americans found jobs in the month of March, and the unemployment rate dropped two-tenths of one percentage point. It stands at 7.3 percent now, which is where it was in January, before the severe cold had taken its toll. In other Washington developments, President Carter issued a proclamation today ending the natural gas emergency that went into effect on February 2nd. He said the imminent shortage of natural gas no longer exists. President Carter has already seen the Israeli Prime Minister, and next week he begins a series of talks with Arab leaders, first with President Anwar Sadat of Egypt. Sadat is winding up a visit to Germany now, and we have a report on that from Bob McNamara. President Sadat and Chancellor Schmidt talked Middle East politics and money. The money Sadat wants for his chaotic economy, but he refused to say how much cash, since the West German parliament is still trying to decide how much it can afford to offer. On the Middle East, Sadat came to ask the chancellor to go to bat for a Middle East peace conference in Geneva this year. Schmidt said he would help, that the time was ripe for a peace agreement, and that next year might be too late. But Schmidt hedged a bit on whether he'd support the idea of full Palestinian participation at a Geneva peace conference. The Chancellor said in one way or another the Palestinians must take part, but equal participation might wreck the chances of getting Israel to agree to sit at the same bargaining table. From Bonn, Sadat goes to Paris tomorrow, then Washington Sunday. He indicated he's hopeful the Carter administration hasn't been distracted from Middle East problems by the new U.S.-Soviet disagreement over strategic arms. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Bonn. The World Tonight continues after this message. 
And now, Eric Severide's commentary. Schomburier is a new word of German coinage, invented, so British journalist Bernard Levin tells us, by student revolutionaries in Germany. To justify their ruthless methods designed to destroy the educational system first, the whole democratic system later. It means the shame barrier. The true believer must conquer the shame barrier. We saw some such among American students in the 60s. We see it with terrorists who kill the innocent. We see it in diluted form with authors who glorify sadism. With a few investigative journalists who justify breaking confidences and stealing documents. We saw it with CIA and FBI agents sworn to uphold the law who broke the law. In some cases, it's necessary to think of two barriers at once, the shame barrier and the memory barrier. Today's German students who pass through the shame barrier do so partly because they are stopped by the memory barrier. They do not know that it was their precursors after World War I who did much to destroy the Weimar Republic and bring on Adolf Hitler. And there was an apt exhibition of both barriers in this country Monday night in the Oscar Movie Award program. Playwright Lillian Hellman passed through the shame barrier by accepting applause not for her art, but for her political activities in the McCarthy era. And Miss Jane Fonda, who introduced her, was stopped by the memory barrier. She did not know, apparently, that Miss Hellman was a systematic supporter of Stalinism, in spite of its mass horrors for many, many years, and a savage critic of American liberals who opposed both McCarthy and the American communists. These liberals earned not applause, but the satisfaction of being historically right. On Capitol Hill now, a congressional committee has begun another reinvestigation of the President Kennedy and Martin Luther King assassinations. If they find one vital revealing fact hitherto unknown, all will be grateful. But both barriers are present. Any number of nuts, fantasizers, and publicity-hungry or money-hungry people will seek to testify. With luck, committee members and staff assistants will not join them in passing through the shame barrier with self-enhancing leaks of gossip and ragtag evidence. The memory barrier is more likely to injure them and the listening and reading public. They had better be old enough or scholar enough to know what claims and conjectures are old and discredited or embroideries on the old and discredited. Otherwise, they will put us all through a year or more of tensions, suspicions, acrimony, and distrust not wholly different from the McCarthy period. This is Eric Severide in Washington. And finally, a shopping note. If you're flush and looking for a boat, you might like to consider the presidential yacht Sequoia. It's on the market now because President Carter thinks the $800,000 a year it costs to maintain it is unjustified and unnecessary. Harold Brown and his associates at the Pentagon will have the asking price. And that's The World Tonight, Friday, April 1st. The World Tonight is produced by Richard Carlson. Have a good weekend. This is Douglas Edwards, CBS News. This is Walter Cronkite reporting with news and commentary on the CBS radio network. The Warren Commission report on the assassination of President Kennedy found that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone in the murder. For years, efforts have been made to discredit that report, though so far none has. Still, doubts about the validity of the finding have persisted. And those doubts have been intensified by allegations that the CIA and the FBI withheld potentially relevant information from the commission. Similar doubts have persisted about the investigation into Martin Luther King's murder. Last year, the House voted to establish a committee to re-examine both murders in the hopes of finally resolving those doubts one way or the other. The committee would conduct a thorough, non-partisan, professional investigation. That, at any rate, was the intention. Tragically, however, the conduct of the House Assassinations Committee so far has been a joke, and those who feel strongly about the need for a new investigation often don't know whether to laugh or cry. Some details after this message. Tuesday, the House voted to fund the Assassinations Committee for two years. It was a near thing, more so than the vote count indicated. It followed months of bumbling and wrangling that had many members wondering what they had wrought when they first formed the committee. The committee began by hiring as its staff director an abrasive and controversial prosecutor from Pennsylvania named Richard Sprague. Sprague turned off a number of House members by acting like a congressman himself. He also proposed to use some unorthodox investigative methods, such as the secret electronic monitoring of witnesses to make sure they were telling the truth. The initial budget request was a whopping $13 million for a two-year study. The House gagged at that and told the committee to come back with a realistic figure. It also told the committee to get its house in order. An unusual semi-public squabble had broken out between Sprague and the chairman, Henry Gonzalez. 
Gonzalez ultimately fired the staff director, but was overruled by the full committee. He then resigned as chairman. Prior to the Tuesday vote, there was serious doubt whether the committee could muster enough support to continue its work. Animosity towards Sprague apparently made the difference, and so he also resigned. On the same day that the committee won continuance, a prospective witness was found dead. An apparent suicide, but nevertheless a grim reminder of the seriousness of this investigation. The witness, George de Morenschelt, allegedly had told a Dutch journalist he was involved with Oswald in a conspiracy financed by Texas oil men and anti-Castro Cubans. Wednesday, the committee inadvertently revealed the existence of another witness, a woman who claims she can link Oswald with Jack Ruby, the man who gunned down the accused assassin. The committee was told that the woman was willing to testify that she saw the two together before the assassination. That information was made public when committee secretaries, by mistake, issued it with other press releases. Also inadvertently issued were the minutes of a secret committee meeting two weeks ago, during which members discussed the choreography for winning congressional and public support. They talked about how to handle the press, about the dramatic impact of a witness who invoked the Fifth Amendment on all questions, and about how to present their case to the House. One suggested that the head of the King probe spend 45 minutes bringing the House up to date. The staff member replied that he didn't have enough material and he'd have to do a soft shoe dance to fill the time. During the meeting, Samuel Devine of Ohio uttered what could be the postscript for the committee's behavior today, saying, this, of course, is not the way to conduct an investigation. This is Walter Cronkite reporting for CBS News. I'm Brent Musburger with Sports Time, reporting from Washington. Joe Theismann says this is his year to quarterback in the pros, either in Washington or some other city in the league. Theismann told me last night that he wants the Washington Redskins job, but that if George Allen commits himself again to Billy Kilmer, then Joe would settle for another team. Two improving franchises that might be interested in Joe Theismann's services are the New York Giants and the Chicago Bears. More in a moment. Three of the finest high school basketball players in the country are New York's Albert King and Wayne McCoy and Philadelphia's Gene Banks, along with about 200 college coaches and recruiters and some 16,000 fans in the Capitol Center. I watched the three play in a U.S. high school all-star game last night. Banks, who scored 22 points and was the game's most valuable player, is committed to Duke. But Digger Phelps has made it clear that Notre Dame is interested if Banks changes his mind. Digger is being painted as a scoundrel by Banks' high school coach, which is an injustice to Phelps. Banks' mother is the one who suggested that her son look into Notre Dame. McCoy, 6'9 and 242, reminds me of a young Wes Unseld, and he's the prize being hotly pursued by North Carolina State. King, high school's most publicized player this year, did not shoot well last night, 3 of 11, but he pulled down 15 rebounds, and afterwards I asked him which schools he'd visited that had impressed him. Well, I visit Arizona State, Kansas State, and I'm going to visit uh, UCLA on April 15th. Now, we have heard that Las Vegas, Nevada has also impressed you. Jerry Tarkanian was in here earlier this week. Well, I've been thinking about it. I have been thinking about that. I'll say that. Albert, have you enjoyed this, being heavily recruited by everyone, or has it got to be a burden? I enjoy it. Uh, if I didn't have it, you know, I wouldn't know how it is. But since I have it like this, I enjoy it. Has Bernard tried to sell you on Tennessee or any of the schools down in the southeast? No, not really. We really, have, we really haven't discussed it at all. Albert's older brother, Bernard, was among those here in Washington, and like everyone else, he was disappointed in his brother's shooting. The best guard on the floor was Darnell Valentine of Wichita, Kansas. He's quick and he plays good defense, which means he may go further than some of the eastern stars with the flashy reputations. Until tomorrow, Brent Musburger on the CBS Radio Network. Today in business, a drop in the unemployment rate. I'm Ray Brady, reporting on the CBS Radio Network. The number of unemployed in the nation dipped to 7 million last month, bringing the unemployment rate down from 7.5% to 7.3%. That was largely the result of the weather, however, rather than any pickup in the economy, because the improvement came from a drop in unemployed adult men, exactly the people who were hit the worst by factory closings during the bitter weather early this year. More after this. That dip in unemployment did help to perk up Wall Street. The number of shares traded on the big board wasn't large, just about 17.5 million shares. But the Dow Jones Industrial Average did work its way higher, rising by roughly eight and a quarter points. 
That brings the average up to 927.36. A lot of the institutions, banks, pension funds, and similar big investors had been selling stocks. But William Lefebvre of the Wall Street firm of Granger & Company thinks that today's close may be a sign some of that has stopped. This eight-point rally uh, would indicate to me that while it was on low volume, uh, that the institutions, at least for the moment, have stopped selling. And to build a fave, that means there could, could be better times ahead for Wall Street. It could be that we have seen the end of the uh, uh, massive selling that we noticed uh, uh, down through March, and that from here on we may find a more even balance between buyers and sellers, with hopefully uh, a slight balance uh, favoring the buyers, which would mean for higher prices. One footnote, at the very least, Wall Street's got to be very happy to see the end of the first quarter. Because during these past three months, the Dow Jones Industrial Average has dropped by no less than 85 points. In Washington, President Jimmy Carter let the other shoe drop. The American makers of shoes had been calling for a cutback on the number of shoes imported into this country, saying they're damaging the domestic industry. The president said today he'll seek voluntary reductions from the major importers, such as Taiwan and South Korea. In financial markets abroad, in a surprise move, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark announced the devaluation of their currencies. Now this. That's Today in Business. I'm Ray Brady, CBS News. Newsbreak PM, this is Reed Collins reporting on the CBS radio network. A new terror trial is taking shape in Israel. The story after this. Kurt and Inga Schultz ended a long search yesterday when they interviewed their daughter, 23-year-old Brigitte, in a jail in Jerusalem. For 15 months they had searched for their daughter. Recently the West German Foreign Ministry was told that Brigitte was a prisoner in Israel, along with another young German and a trio of Arabs. Unofficial sources say they had been seized in Kenya planning a terror attack on an Israeli airliner and were spirited to Israel. CBS Newsman Bruno Wassertile is in Tel Aviv. Secrets aren't very easily kept in Israel, uh, and uh, especially for so long a time. So there was a lot of surprise on that score. But why the secrecy for 15 months? It might have been uh, to uh, prevent some uh, new terrorist move to try to free the two Germans and perhaps the uh, three Arabs that were arrested with them at that time. And also, it might have been an attempt to uh, milk the five people concerned for all their information and not let uh, the Arabs know that they know the information that they received from these five. They were identified as members of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, one of the most radical uh, wings of the Arab guerrilla movement. A military trial is planned soon behind closed doors, but at this point the nature of the coming trial is not completely clear. A military court has the right to uh, keep uh, newsmen and journalists out. It's at the court's own discretion. But this may really mean a, uh, a closed-door trial with only the defendants and uh, the judges and the witnesses being able to go in. Perhaps they don't want the Arab guerrilla organizations to know just how much they know from the people that they caught. But I think if, if uh, nobody is allowed at the trial, I think it would probably raise some sort of outcry here that uh, civil rights, even for suspected terrorists, uh, are not being followed. Bruno Wassertile in Tel Aviv. Now this. Newsbreak PM for Friday, April 1st. This is Reed Collins, CBS News. CBS News. President Carter says the natural gas emergency which was declared on February 2nd is over. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Details on the president's pronouncement from Ed Bradley at the White House. The gas emergency is over, at least as defined by the Emergency Natural Gas Act of 1977. But President Carter said the fact that this winter's natural gas emergency is over in no way signals an end to our energy crisis. The emergency was declared because of the shortages of natural gas brought on by the severe winter weather. But Mr. Carter, in a statement released by the White House, added, unless we take remedial action to develop a natural Natural gas policy as part of our comprehensive energy policy, our economy and our homes will be in increasing danger with each passing year. The president's energy proposals are to be ready by the 20th of April, and he has promised a comprehensive long-term solution to our energy problems. Ed Bradley, CBS News, the White House. More news in a moment.
President Carter has rejected recommendations that he impose strict quotas and tariffs to try to cut down on shoe imports. The president says he first wants to try negotiations to reduce the number of foreign shoe shipments to this country. The American Footwear Industries Association called the announcement a cruel blow. Domestic shoemakers claim imports have contributed to the loss of up to 165,000 jobs in the past eight years. Some Democrats apparently feel that party loyalists are not getting enough of the federal job pie. The Democratic National Committee is asking President Carter to give state Democratic parties a bigger voice in filling federal jobs. The North Dakota Party chairman commented that the White House recently gave two appointments to Republicans from his state. Officials say there will be a delay in the return of the bodies of 325 Americans killed in last Sunday's airplane collision at Tenerife Airport in the Canary Islands. The arrival originally due Sunday will probably not take place until later in the week. Two planes carrying the remains of Dutch victims of the ill-fated KLM plane arrived in Holland a short while ago. Dave Durham reports from Amsterdam. It was shortly after midnight Amsterdam time when the first KLM jet, a DC-8, touched down at Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport. It was followed 15 minutes later by the second jet. On board were the bodies of the 248 victims from the ill-fated KLM jumbo jet. The planes taxied immediately into a hangar where the bodies will remain for several days while the tedious process of identification continues. The area around the hangars have been sealed off by state police under government order. Families of the victims were not allowed near the area, and they had previously been asked to stay away from the airport. Also, news personnel were not allowed in the immediate vicinity. Dave Durham for CBS News, Amsterdam. The Labor Department says unemployment fell during March by two-tenths of a percentage point. The March unemployment rate stood at 7.3 percent of the workforce. Treasury Secretary Michael Blumenthal says he does not expect any significant increase in interest rates this year. Blumenthal told reporters in Washington the federal budget deficit will be declining and that bank loans have been slow. On Wall Street today, the Dow Jones Industrials were up 8.23. The average price per share on the New York Exchange ahead 25 cents. Volume 17 and a half million shares. Now this. The American Cancer Society says there is no evidence that saccharin causes cancer in humans. But the society says it will investigate saccharin and will urge a study by independent scientists. The Food and Drug Administration says it intends to ban saccharin based on Canadian tests showing that large doses of the sugar substitute cause tumors in rats. This is Doug Poling, CBS News.